Hi there, my name's Andy Young and I'm one of the automotive lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland, New Zealand. And on this video, I'm going to show you how to check for various bent uh, suspension and steering components as a result of uh, the vehicle not crashing, not due to poor maintenance, but actually getting pushed out of the way by another four-wheel drive. Now, the vehicle in question is... Yamaha Viking, that's one of the riding ATVs. This one's a three-seater for the Viking. It's got three, three seats rather than two on the Rhinos. And uh, the front left-hand wheel made contact. Whilst the Viking was stationary, it was pushed out of the way by a, another much heavier vehicle. And it's exerted forces onto the Viking, which it's not really designed to take. It's not the kind of forces that it would experience that the design has allowed for under normal use, which means that all sorts of stuff can get bent. Now, I've already inspected the frame of the vehicle, the chassis, and um, the things I've been looking for is cracked paint, stress marks, uh, and I've taken some measurements as well to make sure that the left-hand side of the chassis, the measurements match up to the distances on the equivalent points around the right-hand side of the chassis. And, you know, within half a mil, we're on. So we're all happy with that. That's definitely within tolerance. Uh, and that, that's a manufacturer's tolerance, not, not my tolerance for accident damage stuff. Um, but it does mean that we've got a number of components still to check. And in the previous video, we removed um, the knuckle joint, we removed um, the hub and the brake disc. Uh, we removed both the upper and the lower arms. Uh, we also removed uh, well, we inspected the steering system on the left hand side of the vehicle and we found that the outer ball joint, the track rod end, that's faulty so that's, that's already a fail, that's going to need to be replaced. Um, the inner joint tested out just fine, it was still uh, tight uh, in all directions in its full movement. It was tight, there were no um, slack points and there were no really tight points. It was even, even tightness throughout its full movement. Uh, and there was no knock, there was no play when you're pulling that joint in and out. So the inner joint on the steering rack um, on the left hand side is fine. And the steering rack itself, there's no indication of any kind of play or damage to the teeth. It's smooth when you move it lock to lock as well. So quite happy with that and we'll leave that well alone. Um, we, we're already going to change the knuckle joint. We know the knuckle joint's been damaged. That was highlighted um, in the first video during disassembly on the diagnostics. And we found that this hole here, which is where the, the top ball joint fits, has been very badly damaged. And I don't know if you can see that on the video or not, but it's, it is actually distorted. There's some pretty serious damage to that hole. It's not, maybe you can see that, it's not ideally round. We've got a raised part down here now. And the ball joint itself, the tapered part of the ball joint, the stud, was loose in that hole. And that was what was giving us all that movement on the wheel. So we're going to replace the knuckle joint. We know, and as a result of that, we're going to replace things like wheel bearings. We're also, as a matter of course, going to be replacing both the upper and the lower outer ball joints. Because they have a nylon lining. And when you get this kind of stress applied to them, it damages the nylon. It pushes it out of the way and it creates... Um, you know, play essentially in that joint. So they're going to be replaced. So what's left to check, you say? Well, I really want to try and keep the cost of this repair relative. You know, I don't want to just order everything in the hope that that cures the problems. Um, I'm better than that. There's no point in wasting, wasting money, whether it's the insurance companies um, or the customers. Now, on these wishbones, and this is the this is the lower wishbone. We have these tubes, and there's obviously one either side to make the a, what we call a, a, you know, like an A-frame style, the, the wishbone. And it's got the two mounts on the chassis, and it's got the mount at the outside here. For This is the lower ball joint mount. And there's no indications of any kind of stress, even the paint's still intact on there. So that survived pretty well. I think the top ball joint's taken all the stress because that's where the bumper was making contact. However, these pipes should be dead straight. Now, for us to see that this tube, to check this tube essentially is straight, which actually isn't. Just try and put the device before. Okay. Um, it should be straight. 
Yamaha will have used a straight bit of tube. You know, either it's going to have a decent bend on it, or it's you know in the design, or it's going to be a straight piece of tube. They're not going to change it by a fraction of a degree. So if you make sure you've got some kind of straight edge, now a ruler's going to be okay for this job. This kind of thing isn't made to huge, you know, really really tiny tolerances like in an engine. And I'm going to use a feeler gauge really only for the camera. Um, what I can do for myself is I can lay that on the tube and I can see that we've got clearance in the middle of the ruler. Um, but just to highlight that to you on camera, if I get, a, get the feeler gauge, then I can run that very easily up and down the center part of that ruler. There's, there's actually quite a big air gap, probably I would say about almost a millimeter right in the center. Now that tells me that this tube is bent down like that. And it shouldn't be like that. That's a fail. And when we get the new component, we'll do exactly the same test on the new one, just to confirm that this actually is damaged. Um, but it shouldn't be bent. And for me, that's a fail. And the lower wishbone is going to be replaced. I don't need to inspect it any further than that. We're going to be replacing it. If we're going to replace it, we're going to have to fit new bushes at either end. Sure, I can reuse the bolts. The bolts, you know, give them a spin. Nah, they're not bent. We can reuse those fine. There's no problem with that. But the bushes, to take the bushes out will we'll damage them, no doubt. And the customer shouldn't have to put up with that. So we're going to fit new bushes, uh, reuse the bolts, and a new lower wishbone. So that's inspected. It's a fail. And we'll get a new one. Um, Oops, crunch. As regards the upper wishbone, now this is a little bit shorter and it's a little bit stronger. The tube is um, a, a thicker design, but the upper wishbone we know took a pretty big um, amount of the force when the vehicle was pushed across because we know that the, the point. Wow, that's. I think that's bent. We'll be taking that out in a minute. Um, it, took, it, was, it was subject to the majority of the force uh, by the four-wheel drive pushing it. And the weak point, because it's not straight, it has this like swan neck at the end for the ball joint. Okay, it's cast, but cast can bend. We know that because the knuckle joint's bent. Um, there's no stress marks. Let's do the same test on the tubes. If that passes, then we'll look a little bit further. If, any of, if either of these two tubes is bent, then we're going to fail this anyway, and we don't need to look any further. Okay, so back into the device. Let's try and do it in a way where you can see it on the camera. And we're going to get our straight edge. Now this might be too long actually. Let's see if we can see how it's going to work. Okay, we'll have to do it on the side here. Oh yeah. Okay. So how are you guys going to see that? Hmm. Let's try and work that one out. Okay, a bit of camera re rearrangement there for you. I've got the straight edge and I'm going to just lay it across the back side of this tube. I can't put it over the top because it's going to foul here. I can't put it on this side because there's a welding bracket uh, a bracket welded on. But the, on this side here I've got a, a clean run. And if I put that on there, can you see that we've got a huge gap down this end. There's about 3 mil of clearance. So if I, if I rock the the ruler, you'll see it on about. So that should be a straight tube, and again, the tube is bent. So yet again, this is, is a fail, and the upper wishbone is going to have to be changed. Now there's no need to inspect this any further, uh, although what I want to do is to remove this upper ball joint, because from what I can make out, it's really badly damaged. I want to take the gator off and have a look at that, just out of interest. Okay, so this is the upper ball joint, um, which is currently affixed to the upper arm, the front left upper arm of the suspension, and it's got an incredible offset on it, and it shouldn't have that. So I'm going to take that out of the unit. We know we're going to replace the arm anyway, but, and we know we're going to fit a new ball joint, but just out of interest, I want to have a look at this and just see how much damage is being caused by that ball joint. So to remove your ball joint, and this would this would apply for any kind of ball joint on one of these Vikings, and, and pretty much most of Yamaha's quads, get yourself um, external circlip pliers, some good ones, pop it on the circlip, and 
just give it a little little flex. Oh. Now, if you find it keeps dropping off, good little tip. Grab yourself a little flat screwdriver so that once you get it opened up and you're starting to move, you can get the flat screwdriver underneath and now we can use the flat screwdriver to help to lever it off. There you go, look. Perfect. God. Almost like I know what I'm doing. I even surprise myself sometimes. Okay, now we've removed now the circlet and the ball joint will come out towards me. It's going to come this way. And we're going to need to use our magic hammer. Um, and our magic hammer, with the copper hammer, is in the drawer right behind the camera. So I'm going to have to move you. Sorry. Right, I'm back. Okay. Magic hammer. Now the reason why I'm using this and not a normal hammer is really out of habit. We know that the unit's scrap. Um, if you're putting the ball joint back in and reusing it for whatever reason, maybe you're just taking it off to paint the, the arm or what, you know, whatever reason, then you definitely need to use one of these. It's pretty tight. Okay. Maybe it's pressed in. That it's moving. Okay, so what we will do is we'll just we'll pop the device a bit. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to support the arm using the vise, and that will allow all the shock to be applied directly to the ball joint to get it out. Now, I know the camera is going to bounce around a bit doing this, but it's the only way I can do it. Done. Okay, one ball joint. Now maybe you can see what I was on about. There's a terrible offset. This is normally, I'll stick my neck out, normally uh, along the center. Whereas if you look here, look, it's right up on one side. And I'm gonna remove this boot. We're gonna see really what's going on because I've never seen a ball joint like that where it's had an offset pin. Is that right, Yamaha? I don't think so. So we'll just remove. There we are. Look, we'll just put it on camera, Andy. Put it on camera. Uh, we'll just remove the clip. Now this little clip, it's like a little spring clip, and it just holds that boot in place. Now again, don't forget, we're going to be replacing this, guaranteed. It's going to get replaced. So it doesn't really matter if we damage it. It's going to go in the bin, but. Out of interest, it's good to see what's going on. So, of course, we've got shed loads of grease coming out now. Ugh. Right, that's the boot off. And we need a rag. Mr. Rag, okay. So we'll just get rid of all that grease. So maybe we can see what's going on because it just doesn't seem right to me. Ooh, you're going to like this. Dog. All right. Okay, I just want to get rid of as much grease as I can so you can see what's going on. Okay, this will give you an indication of just how much force that four wheel drive applied to this vehicle to push it out of the way. <clears throat> it's bent. How can I do it? There you are, you can see that now. It's actually bent this pin considerably. Now, um, this area of the pin here was pretty much, this is the tapered area, and that should really, to give you an idea, it should be along that plane. All right, that's how it should be. So looking at the base of the ball and it coming away from the ball, to project that line outwards, it should be about there. And instead, it's been bent about 20 degrees. No wonder that wheel was a bit offset. And that's caused damage to where this taper goes into the knuckle joint. And of course, it's destroyed this ball joint. Now, sure, there's, it's still pretty tight on the actual joint mechanism itself. You know, that's, that's pretty good. That wouldn't be a fail. But to take the boot off and actually have a look and see what's going on, 
that explains an awful lot as to what's happened to that wheel and why it had so much more camber than the other one. Because, you know, a small, a small change on, on that angle would make quite a big difference to the camber. Okay, so definitely a fail. We were going to replace it anyway, but hope you found that a bit interesting. Um, what else have we got to look at? Well, based on all the components we've removed so far, uh, ooh, I've just spotted another ball joint. Let's do a comparison. I'm going to take the other ball joint out of the knuckle joint. Now, again, we're going to be replacing that. I'll take the boot off, and you can see the two, and you'll be able to tell straight away the damage to that bent one. Okay, well, you may as well join in. So, this is me now removing the other ball joint, the one that's actually um, mounted to the base of the knuckle. This is the lower ball joint. Now, again, we're going to be replacing this as a matter of course because these kind of things don't like um, being squashed and pushed and bent. They soon complain about it. Now, Turn it around so we can see what's going on. Finger. Okay. Right, now again that's going to be pressed in there, so I'm going to have to give it a whack with the hammer to get it out. See if I can do it holding it this time so you're not going to get a shock. Okay. A bit hard to get a swing on this one because it's a bit awkward. Almost there, you can see it's, it's coming out now, look. So we'll pop that back in the vise. We'll find some kind of drift or a punch just to finish it off. <clears throat> Let's use, usually pretty good for this kind of thing, some kind of damaged, destroyed extension bars is pretty good. One little vice, you can do it. There we go. Okay, so that's how you get the lower ball joint out of the knuckle. Now, let's just whip that clip off there again. He says without stabbing himself. Should really be wearing gloves now. It's getting a bit grubby. But I'm Yorkshireman. We don't mind dirty hands. Right, so that's the boot off. And now we need Mr. Rag again. Okay. There we go. Okay. Comparison time. Now, these two ball joints, according to Yamaha, uh, and from my memory, are both the same part number, which means they should be identical. Which means, when they're a bit like that, you've got one that's like this, and one that's, if I can rotate it for you, you see that, that one's pretty much straight all the way around. And this one, pretty much isn't. It's very bent. So, yeah. Well done, Mr. Four-wheel drive guy, driving guy, for pushing this out of the way. You did an excellent job. So there you go. Um, ball joints. Yes, they don't just fail through wear if your vehicle gets pushed out of the way or hits a curb. That kind of stuff can result. So really good idea to take the boot off and have a good look. Don't just rely on the fact, is there any play, yes or no. Because if there's no play, then you might as well just pass it. But whip the boot off, have a look, see what's going on. Very important. All right, so summary, where are we at? Well, we've checked everything except the hub and the brake disc. Now, it's actually going to be really difficult to do a run-out test on this hub and brake disc because... It's mounted directly onto the drive shaft, and the drive shaft supports this and locates it through these splines here. 
it's a little bit different to a normal kind of hub. Um, most, quite often, the hubs will have, because it's four-wheel drive, it has to be driven by the drive shaft, so that's why Yamaha has done it the way that they have. But it means that it's actually quite difficult for me to, to do a run-out test. The only way that I can do an accurate run-out test on this is to strip the other side of the vehicle, because these are identical components both sides, fit this to the front right-hand side, and do a run-out test on there. And I'll do that, but there's no need to do it to camera, because you've seen how to take one of these apart, and you're going to see how to install one of these on the video that covers the reassembly of the Viking. Um, as regards how to do a run-out test, it's pretty easy. You just mount a DTI gauge on the side of the disc, and as you rotate the disc, it's going to measure any, any, um, any variance, any change in, in that disc as it moves or flaps from one side to the other because it's, it's buckled, basically. Um, I'm pretty sure it will be. Oh, that's pretty good. Look at that. Okay, mirror. Um, I'm pretty sure that it will be buckled. Uh, you don't... You know, these things run to a very, very high tolerance, so it do, therefore it doesn't, very, it doesn't need much of a bend at all to be a fail. Um, I have one other option that I could do, but because this is a rough casting, it's not going to be ideal. Um, I could mount this in the lathe, and I could then mount the DTI on the lathe, and again I could get a run-out check. But it's not, I don't think it's going to be definitive, because the casting here is rough. Um, yeah, so that's probably not going to be ideal either. It's all getting a bit... Uh, Hmm. Oh no, I could do. I could pop out the studs and I could mount it into the chuck. If the chuck will go big enough, I could mount onto here. And then that would, I can then make sure that this surface here, which is where the wheel goes, is flush to the chuck, of the, the, the chuck on the lathe. And that would give us an accurate uh, DTI reading. So I'm going to have a go at doing that now. Okay, so the DTI is rigged up on the lathe and I've managed to mount the disc to the chuck uh, as squarely as I possibly can actually mounting it from the inner edge of the disc now if I zero the DTI there we go look and then just very gently we'll take that by hand so we're down to about point just over point two point zero two okay and we're down to point zero five point zero six Yeah, 0 0.07, oh golly, 0 0.08, and then back up again. Okay, so we've got, a, we've got basically about 0 0.08 millimetres of deflection, of run out, maybe 9, on that brake disc. So we'll look at, we'll check the specs in the Yamaha book. But I'm pretty confident that a run out of, let's say, 0 0.09 millimetres is probably going to be a fail anyway. So, basically, both wishbones need to be replaced. And, of course, all the bushes are going to be replaced because of that. Um, both bore joints... They're going to get replaced as a matter of course, given the damage anyway. Knuckle joints, that needs to be replaced. Therefore, we're going to be changing the wheel bearings and all the seals. Um, I can reuse the disc guard. Unless, of course, it comes with the knuckle joint. It's probably a separate part, so I won't order one of those. The disc guard is fine. There's no, you know, it does the job. It's saved a few bucks there. Um, the brake disc is the only thing, uh, and the hub, obviously, is the only thing that not really sure about just yet. I need to check the Yamaha specs. So, um, you know, I might be saying to you, hey, you know, a, a run out of 0 0.09 mil is within spec. We can reuse the disc. Um, or a, a run out of 0 0.09 millimeters is actually outside spec and we're going to need to replace the disc. Um, <clears throat> I can't test the hub. I've got no way of testing that at the moment. Uh, I don't want to delay the customer 
as regards the time frame of repair. And I'm going to default back to the, the opinion that if in doubt, and I suspect that the hub, if the disc is bent, I'm suspected, I do suspect that the hub's also damaged. Um, <clears throat> we're going to replace the hub. So the hub's going to get replaced regardless. Let's find out if the disc's in spec. If the disc is in spec, a re reasonably within spec, you know, oh, I should sorry, let's rephrase that, within spec with a reasonable tolerance, then we'll keep the disc. If 0 0.09 mil is somewhere close to the limit of spec, it wasn't like that when it was born. And I'll default back to what I said about the customer at the start. Why should he put up with a vehicle that is now substandard as a result of the uh, insurance claim or the action that results in the insurance claim? So again, you know, it may well be put a new disc on there. Um, yeah, so there you go. Um, I hope you found this uh, video, this short video, helpful. Uh, it might not be too short, who knows. Um, working out what's bent on a vehicle um, sometimes can be quite difficult. Uh, the manufacturers don't give you uh, specific measurements very often. Um, and if the bend is very slight, um, then it can be actually quite difficult to find. So, you know, when you're looking at components, look for the easiest part of that component's test first. Because if that's a fail, then you're going to be replacing the component. You don't need to try and do some really extensive measurements um, to ascertain whether or not that component's got bent on the more intricate parts of it. Check the easy bits first. That makes your life a lot easier. And, and that most definitely helped me out an awful lot uh, on this particular inspection. I've got to go away now uh, and prepare a parts order and get that through to Yamaha as soon as I can. So hopefully we can get this parts order uh, initiated today. And fingers crossed we'll have all the parts within 10 working days. Right, well, my name is Andy Young. I'm one of the automotive lecturers down at Unitech in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, if you found this video helpful, then why not subscribe to the channel? And then that way you're going to get some notifications come through whenever I upload new videos covering new workshop tasks that I've done. If you have any questions or comments, then please do leave them down the bottom and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Okay, cheers for now. Over and out.